النهارده نشكر طبعا دكتور ياسر المحاضره جميله جدا يعني والتقسيمه فالماني هيبرتنشن يعني من الحاجات اللي بتبقى عامله لنا مشكله نقدم حضرتك بقى لوجيكال سيلكشن اوف كارديو فاسكولار سبورت برضه من الحاجات yeah. المهمه ثانك يو فيري ماتش سو ويلكم اجين ان ذيس برزنتيشن از ذا سكند half of the circulation so we discuss معلش ممكن بس الاسئله ممكن نبقى نكتبها يعني دلوقتي عشان تبقى تتقدم في اخر المناقشه اوكي 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 سو ان فيرست برزنتيشن وي ديسكاسد ذا بالمونري بارت اوف ذا هيموداينامكس ناو ويل ديسكاس ذا سيستميك بارت اوف ذا هيموداينامكس اند هاو تو سيلكت ذا ميديكيشن بيزد اون ذا اندرلاينج فيسيولوجي سو ان ان اف يو ار ان يور يونت ستيل يوزينج like one medication or one line of management for everyone like dopamine or dobutamine or whatever medication for everyone that's that's called the empiric empiric support we need to actually move from that kind of support to more physiologic uh, more physiologic uh, based on the underlying pathophysiology again i have nothing to disclose in this presentation and i have again three main objectives to discuss over the next 30 minutes or hopefully less to demonstrate the physiology of systemic blood flow second objective to demonstrate the main phenotypes of hemodynamic instability so as we have five phenotypes for pulmonary hypertension we also we have phenotypes for hemodynamic instability systemic hemodynamic instability and we cannot treat all of them the same way and then we need to demonstrate the logical selection of the cardiovascular support based on the underlying pathophysiologic mechanism So management of systemic shock in five sections. We have five sections, the same like the previous presentation. I try to be like almost similar. So increase the knowledge retention. Um, basic physiology of cardiovascular performance. Hopefully I will be quick on that. Physiologic phenotypes of hemodynamic instability. Hemodynamic instability in specific neonatal conditions. So we select the most common neonatal conditions and how to select the medication to fit each category of them. And then the therapeutic options at the end, I have the management algorithm. So let us start. Basic physiology of cardiovascular, cardiovascular performance, we have two things to under, need to understand. Physiologic determinants of blood flow, what's determining the blood flow in our body, and then blood pressure variables. So we need to understand the physiology of the blood pressure. And uh, not just mean blood pressure equal to gestational age. That's kind of 15 years ago uh, uh, practice in our unit. So the six physiologic determinants of blood flow, preload, afterload, poor myocardial performance, tachycardia or heart rate, low uh, loss of arterial vascular resistance, which is our loss of vascular tone, low, va low systemic vascular resistance, or loss of uh, peripheral vascular tone. Yeah, sorry, there are five, I just made, like I repeated number four twice. And left right chant physiology. So let's start with the preload. Prelude means that uh, the volume of the blood remaining in the ventricle at the end of systole. So we have the systole the, the, uh, at the end of diastole. So we have the systole means ejection of the blood out of the heart. At the end of systole, we should have at least one third of the blood remaining. If you see in the heart at the end of systole, no blood left, it means that we have se severe hypovolemia. That's why it's very helpful to look at the forward chamber view by echo and assess the volume of the heart. Exactly, it is, yeah, the, yeah, eject, yeah. So e ejection fraction, it's about 60 to 70%. It means that the rest left in the heart. Very good, thank you very much. So the systemic venous return to the left atrium or pulmonary venous return to the, sorry, the systemic venous return to the right atrium or pulmonary venous return to the left atrium. For normal, normal prelude, you need systemic blood flow to be adequate. You need also lung ventilation to be matching around point uh, eight to one. And you need also ventricle, ventricle compliance to be normal. So you need normal compliance of the left ventricle. You need uh, lung ventilation uh, perfusion ratio to be optimized. So good lung inflation and you need good blood volume in the systemic circulation. So this is an example how to see the low preload. So you can see that almost there's no blood left in the 
ventricles at the end of systole, and that could be due to low systemic blood volume, high pulmonary vascular resistance, like in pulmonary hypertension, or poor myocardial performance, especially poor diastolic performance. And then after load. After load refers to resistance that myocardium should overcome to push the stroke volume. So the heart contracts against systemic vascular resistance. And this contraction against resistance is after load. So th if the heart contracts against too much resistance, then it is too much after load. It means that the ventricles might get tired and might fail at the end. So the next expected sequen uh, consequence is LV dysfunction. And LV dysfunction secondary to a high systemic vascular resistance uh, should be compensated by tachycardia. So you'll see the heart is very tachycardiac in this situation. And you can, we can hold, have also RV dysfunction instead of uh, left when you, the left, right ventricle is contracting against the high pulmonary vascular resistance. So it is uh, the ventricles does not uh, have the enough power to contract against resistance, either systemic, so you'll have LV dysfunction, or pulmonary, you have RV dysfunction. And then we have the combined both systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance are really high. That's as we explained in the previous uh, presentation. And just I have some um, images for the third type, which is, or the third factor, which is poor myocardial systemic performance. That can be secondary to high after load as well. So we have the ventricles are really uh, tired from contraction and there is no good squeezing. The, uh, the volume at the end of systole is uh, almost the same as the volume at the end of diastole. And you have here also very uh, poor heart performance. That's early. Late stages, you will see the heart very dilated. So with the prolonged poor myocardial performance, we'll see dilated cardiomyopathy. We'll see the heart is very dilated, and congestive heart failure will be the end results. So early compensation is tachycardia, and late compensation is dilated congested heart. <clears throat> so next, we have the tachycardia with the reduced filling. So you can see here, due to tachycardia, the heart filling is, is very poor. And that might be induced, the most common cause of tachycardia in NICU, abuse of in troops. So when you use too much in troops, you will get tachycardia, and the filling will be impaired. You will worsen the hypotension and worsen systemic performance. So that's physician-induced hypotension. And we need to avoid doing that. So loss of bre uh, peripheral vascular resistance, like in peripheral vasodilation, you will see the stagnation of the blood in peripheral circulation, and that will be compensated by tachycardia, because the heart now is contracting against lower resistance. So it's easier for the heart to contract. So we'll see the heart is hyperdynamic. That's why we describe hyperdynamic circulation in, by echo in case of pulmonary, or, or sorry, or systemic vasodilation or uh, vasodilator physiology. So the blood pressure variables, that's the most important slide to understand in this presentation. Again, as we described in the previous presentation, blood pressure is directly proportional to two things, cardiac output or the blood flow multiplied by systemic vascular resistance. And we need to understand which one is affected more than the other. So when you have high, uh, sorry, low uh, systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output might be slightly high, this is consistent with vasodilator physiology. So the resistance is low because of loss of vascular tone. But if you have high resistance, high systemic vascular resistance with low cardiac output, so now the heart is contracting against high resistance. That's what we call the vasoconstrictor physiology. And we call it in pediatric age as cold shock, when you have severe, significant peripheral vasoconstriction. But when we have both, that's really late stage, both are low. So systemic vascular resistance low, cardiac output is also low when you have cardiogenic shock. So we have everything bad. The resistance is low, so we have vasodilator, and also the heart performance is, is low. That might happen in late stages of shock if you did not start medication in a proper time. So physiology of blood pressure, so we also we need to understand the physiology of blood pressure because you understand when you have the low diastolic blood pressure and normal systolic, what does that mean, or the opposite? So the baseline blood pressure in the arterial circulation is the systolic blood pressure. It is the lowest pressure during the circulation in arterial circulation, which is equal to two things, either systemic vascular resistance or blood volume. So when you have low overall uh, blood volume in the systemic circulation, the systolic blood pressure is also low. What's the example of that? When you have preterm infant who's PDA. So the PDA is stealing blood for systemic to pulmonary, 
So you have less volume to the systemic circulation. You have low diastolic blood pressure, and the systolic will stay normal or high. That's why the pulse pressure will be wide. And the heart will contract on top of the diastolic blood pressure to create the pulse pressure. And the pulse pressure is a pressure reflective of heart performance, not the systolic. That's one of the common mistakes in um, some of our understanding of the physiology. It is a pulse pressure that reflects the heart performance. So pulse pressure equal to heart performance uh, either as a pump or as a stroke volume. So the pump function or stroke volume will be reflected. When you have the, the pulse pressure narrow, it means that the heart performance is poor. And then both, the sum of both, pulse pressure plus diastolic will give the systolic pressure. So don't consider that systolic is reflective of systolic performance of the heart because it's a sum of both pressures. So based on that, we have five uh, categories of or phenotypes of systemic uh, or hemodynamic uh, instability. So the first phenotype, category number one, or uh, phenotype number one, phasodilator physiology. So when you have low diastolic pressure, low resistance, and the pulse pressure could be normal or high, Based on that, the systolic blood pressure also will be low because it is sum of both, so diastolic and pulse pressure. Stroke volume might increase because the heart will be hyperdynamic. Heart rate will be high because of also hyperdynamic heart and the estimated cardiac output in this case might be higher than normal. And then in this case, we have low systemic vascular resistance. It is one of the parameters that easy you can calculate the debit side. You need from the echo to measure the cardiac output and mean arterial blood pressure. So mean arterial blood pressure divided by cardiac output, you'll get systemic vascular resistance. It's typically normal between 100 to 200 millimeter mercury per liter per kg per minute, because you, you will convert the cardiac output to liter per minute. As you can see here, the heart is very hyperdynamic, good systolic performance, then we should not give any troops to this infant. So this infant, the most common cause of hypotension is the vasodilator physiology, and we should not give any troops. Typically, the heart is hyperdynamic, and you need to give vasopressor you need to increase the resistance in this case. As you can see here, in this uh, blood pressure trend by uh, invasive blood pressure, you can see the trend is decreasing, and just after, in no time after the start of phasopressor, the blood pressure improved. When you start the medication, the right medication, you will get the improvement in no time. The common scenarios here, septic shock, uh, um, systemic inflammation, late onset shock in preterm infant, or subrenal dysfunction, we may see some premature infants with negative culture, but they develop hypotension due to suprarenal dysfunction, and they typically improve if you start steroids for them. Medications might be induced, like phasodilators. If you start merinor dobitamine, you may induce uh, low blood pressure by uh, phasodilator effect of these medications, um, uh, medications like morphine or anesthesia drugs. Very common to have infant coming from OR, with low blood pressure, typically because of anesthesia drugs used, and just needs uh, like a transient time of uh, phasopressor. Acidosis, respiratory acidosis, metabolic acidosis, should be corrected first before giving any phasopressors, because typically acidosis or low pH might induce or might affect the vascular tone. And HIE as well, one of the, um, uh, uh, one of the categories that we may see phasodilator shock. Phasoconstrictor uh, physiology, when you have diastolic blood pressure high, you can see the trend of the diastolic pressure is getting high. Typically, the pulse pressure will be very narrow, and that will show the trend of that. Systemic uh, systolic pressure will be low, secondary to low pulse pressure, stroke volume low, heart rate high because of compensation, and the cardiac output by echo is expected to be low, and estimated high vascular resistance, systemic vascular resistance expected to be high, and as you can see here in this infant with preterm postnatal transition failure, very poor myocardial performance. Uh, like there is no significant difference between systolic and the diastolic volumes. And look at the trend here. Just uh, looking at this trend is enough to diagnose this category. So you have the blood pressure trend, and suddenly the, the baseline of the diastolic blood pressure increased with narrowing of the pulse pressure. In this case, in no time, the blood, the blood pressure dropped, but the pulse pressure widened with the use of merinone in this typical case. Common causes of vasoconstrictor uh, shock, failure of postnatal transition. That's why sometimes in premature infants, postnatally, we use dobutamine as a first line. post bd ligation syndrome, although we are not using a BD ligation by surgery anymore. 
post EV malformation embolization, in some cases of pulmonary hypertension, in some cases of HIE, and some cases of, of septic shock, although in septic shock, the uh, phasodilator physiology is more common. The third the physiology is cardiogenic shock. So we have low diastolic pressure, low pulse pressure, low systolic, everything is low, everything is bad. So we have low cardiac output and very dilated, poor performance. Heart is barely contracting. That's really easy to diagnose and very difficult to manage. And you can see here the blood pressure trend, everything is low. So the trend is down, the pulse pressure is narrow, everything to the ground. And this infant, because we picked up the case just a few hours, bedside nurse just came to me and uh, like uh, she told me that the pulse pressure is getting very narrow. Uh, just in no time after we started, nor, uh, started epinephrine in this case, the blood pressure improved. Just in 0.05 dose. Common causes, low preload, failure of postnatal transition, myocardial dysfunction, uh, progressive acidosis, overdose of any troops. One of the very common causes, if you are using high dose of any troops unnecessarily, you will get the feeling very uh, low of the heart and you might induce cardiogenic shock. And the treatment of that is just to discontinue the wrong medication. And we have like a typical centile values for the blood pressure, which is available and is published. That's uh, all, uh, already recognized by the, um, uh, the Canadian Neonatal Network. And the standard now in most of the units in Canada, we started using that almost um, 10 years ago in our unit. And then now it is available in all of the units in Canada. So we have the centile values according to gestational age starting from 22 weeks to, uh, to uh, 42 weeks, first day of life, and there is another table for beyond the first day of life. So we have one table for the first day and the table for beyond the first day because during postnatal transition, the blood pressure is different. We cannot assume that infant who just born, the blood pressure to be the same like infant who's five days old. And uh, I think the same table is published in one of the articles which I will show to you. Uh, here, look at the trend. For, for example, in this example here, this infant's 23 weeks, the blood pressure was just very low, and the diastolic blood pressure was, I think, it, uh, to, uh, mean blood pressure is 20, and the, the diastolic was 13. Although the blood pressure is plateau maintained, and the non lactic acidosis in is stable, so giving just one, do, uh, one uh, polus for saline increased the blood pressure significantly. That's enough to induce IVH. If you give uh, just normal saline unindicated for the first three days of life for a premature infants, that's enough to induce IVH, interventricular hemorrhage. So that should be avoided unless uh, you need it. If you don't have invasive blood pressure monitor, you can also in sick infants rely on very uh, frequent use of non-invasive uh, blood pressure by cuff. And in unstable infants, you need to do that very frequently. Like every 10 to 15 minutes, you can adjust the monitor and apply the cuff, and the monitor will, will measure that. So that doesn't need the bedside nurse to do that every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes. You can adjust the monitor, and the monitor can like, measure the blood pressure and give you the number every 10 to 15 minutes if you don't have the invasive blood pressure technology. And by putting all of the uh, measured values together, you can see the trend. So you can see that, that you realize that the trend is going down almost the same as invasive, almost the same like invasive blood pressure. And you can realize that this infant is developing shock. And in target natal echo, we are relying on left ventricle performance, right ventricle performance, BDE shunt, and first line uh, uh, management for each one of them should be based on the category. And tomorrow we have a workshop and we'll, dis we'll discuss uh, management interventions and case scenarios in more details. And we have centile values for all of the values for each category, and including the diastolic blood pressure, pulse pressure, perfusion index, systemic vascular resistance, cardiac output, and near-field spectroscopy for the brain. And for any deviation of the centile value, we can easily diagnose which category that we need to treat. And this graph is available in the article. I will show you the article. Uh, at the end of the presentation, and then I will almost at the end. So hemodynamic instability in specific conditions, we have preterm infant early postnatal transition. Vasoconstructor physiology is common, that's why probably dobutamine might be considered first, but if you wait more time, the infant might develop cardiogenic shock. Con consider that even preterm infant early might develop vasodilator physiology. So, uh, you may need to select the medication based on the uh, phenotype of the blood pressure. 
and then left right shunt uh, with the, through the BDE might also contribute to low blood flow and then hypovolemic shock might be also uh, responsible for the low systemic blood flow. Late preterm, the most common physiology is the vasodilator physiology. In late preterm infant, either due to septic shock or due to suprarenal dysfunction, left right shunt physiology uh, due to PDA if untreated, hypovolemic shock due to third space losses in case of septic shock. And in septic shock, you may have vasodilator physiology. So don't assume that vasodilator physiology is the same like septic shock. Septic shock, you may have uh, third space losses, so you may have hypovolemia at the same time that you need to give fluids, not only phasopressors. And in rare cases, you may have phasoconstrictor physiology, uh, especially in older kids. And then in HIE, cardiogenic shock is very common because of uh, prenatal hypoxia, phasoconstrictor physiology, after cooling, because cooling might induce peripheral phasoconstriction and might cause phasoconstrictor physiology. Uh, and then phasodilator physiology might also happen. And then hypovolemic shock also uh, might be contributing. And IDM, it is contraindicated to use any troops in IDM with hypertrophy of the heart, just the fluids. And sometimes use uh, uh, beta blockers to slow the heart rate to give more time for uh, filling of the heart. In pulmonary hypertension, uh, phasodilator physiology is the most common. Cardiogenic shock might also happen with, if you have LV and RV dysfunction. And then phasoconstrictor physiology might be associated. Then you need to select your medication again based on the underlying physiology. Post BDA closure, uh, phasoconstrictor physiology, the most common medication used on post BDA ligation syndrome is mer merlinone or dobutamine. Hypovolemic shock, and you need to prime the heart with volume. And then at uh, later stages, if you are not really considering treatment early, you may get cardiogenic shock. Remember that you may have more than phenotype at the same time. So you may have vasodilator physiology with hypovolemic shock at the same time. So at the end, uh, I already mentioned about the categories of the medications. Vasopressors should be used in vasodilator physiology. In the troops, uh, plus vasopressor or cardiogenic shock, although we are not using dopamine uh, too much now. Uh, it is a medication that might increase the brain oxygen consumption might increase the pulmonary vascular resistance, might increase the coronary or the myocardial oxygen consumption as well. So it's not the medication that's preferred to be used. Even in adult uh, shock, they are not really commended to use dopamine. And if you need to use it, don't take exceed 10 mics per kg per minute. And in the troops of vasodilator to be used in uh, vasoconstrictor physiology or cardiogenic shock, like dobutamine or merinone, fluids indicated if there is evidence of hypovolemic shock and steroids in refractory cases. Uh, so at the end, this is the algorithm. I will not go through the algorithm in details, but I will refer you to the article so you can read the details about that. It's just a summary of everything. What you need to select as a first line in preterm infant, what you need uh, late versus early in septic shock, what you need to consider as a first line. And it's better to combine once you con, uh, combine with echocardiography once you need to use more than one agent. If you use one agent and there is no response, better to ask someone expert in echo or in hemodynamics to assess the heart performance and more detailed assessment of hemodynamics. And this is the article. If you would like to get the de most of the details in this presentation, uh, you don't have to get a copy of the slides. You just need to uh, uh, get this article. And it is available of, online. If you don't have institutional access, let, let me know by email, and I can send you a copy of the, uh, of the article. One of the case scenarios here, you have IDM infant with hypertrophic heart, and you have the blood pressure here is um, 52 over 38 with mean of 46, and the calculated vascular uh, system resistance 484. That's very high. Vascular resistance should not exceed 200 uh, millimeter mercury per kg per liter per minute. And then the, the cerebral uh, saturation by nurse was very low. In this um, infant, the, if you look at the clinical data, it is vasoconstrictor physiology. But we should not use dobutamine to treat this case. It's contraindicated to use any troops. That's why you cannot diagnose it without echo. And with echo, it's just the fluids, volume uh, expansion, and that's it. Don't give any troops. And in some situations, we give beta blockers to slow the heart rate to give more time for filling. 
that's typical infant or diabetic mother with hypertrophy. In preterm infant with postnatal transition failure, you have also systemic vascular resistance, high 320, low cardiac output by echo, and low blood pressure. Uh, and in this case, it is vasoconstrictor physiology, and the dobutamine of 5 to 10 mics is enough if it is used early. So if, if you started to use the medications and they exceed 15, 20 mics, and there is no response, it is either you, have, you are dealing with the case with a reversible shock, you are, or you are using a wrong medication and you need to change your strategy. And if the infant is unresponsive to cardiovascular medication, either it is wrong medication, so you need to change your strategy, or it is a high dose of inotropes, so you need, instead of increasing the dose, you need to wean and watch for response. It could be superior dysfunction, so you need to add uh, steroids, or it could be missed cardiac uh, pathology, then you need to consult a pediatric cardiologist for that. Um, you, may, you might ask me, so what's the difference? What's the difference between what we have been doing for 30 years of using one strategy, just one line medication for everyone, dopamine for everyone, as a first line, compared to what I'm explaining now or claim that it is physiologic based. So we compared in our unit three years of the previous practice and 10 years, like before 10 years, compared to after we implemented the, what's called the integrated evaluation of hemodynamics, when you use a, a neonatologist uh, uh, trained in hemodynamics to design or manage cases with the hemodynamic instability based on echocardiography, near field spectroscopy, a clinical assessment. So we compared with both era, three years against the three years, and what we found that there is 50% reduced the time to clinical recovery. There is num less number of deaths, although the number was not really, um, the number, total number of patients uh, was not um, enough to comment on death, but the less trend of death is over uh, the period of implementation of integrated evaluation of hemodynamics, but the time to clinical recovery used to 50% was much less number of medications. Instead of using more than one agent, one agent in most of the cases was enough. So I have three conclusions. Understanding physiology of hemodynamics is crucial step in the management of hemodynamics. Integrated clinical uh, target natal echo performed by the neonatologist plus near field spectroscopy, if available, is helpful to formulate physiologic based medical recommendation. If you don't have echo or NIRS, there is no any excuse that you like not to read the blood pressure in a physiologic way. Look at the blood pressure in details as a trend, systolic, diastolic, pulse pressure, and look at the trend, and you can get a lot of information from that. Look at the perfusion index. Look at the clinical data that you have at the bedside. Uh, integrated evaluation of hemodynamics is proven to shorten the time to clinical recovery. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yasser, for your very, very, very useful lectures. أنا ليا رجاء إن المحاضرتين دول يتسجلوا ويتحطوا يعني ناس تعرفها علشان ده مهم قوي في الأطباء اللي قاعدين نبطشيات اللي هم ما بيقدروش يجوا يسمعوا الحاجات دي فده هيبقى مفيد وده مسؤوليتنا كلنا بصراحة لانه معرفه الفيسيولوجي بيبقى لها اثر كبير على القرارات المانجمنت اللي هنقدم دلوقتي دكتور محمد تهامي كلينيكال مانجر ماسيمو ميدل ايست ثانك يو دكتور